Um, and welcome to our virtual information webinar. Uh, my name is Patrick Cassidy and I'm the Director of Admissions and, uh, and Enrollment Management here at Sacred Heart Major Seminary. We're excited to see that you have interest in Sacred Heart and our licentiate in Sacred Theology in the new evangelization. We hope this time will draw you to want to learn more about the seminary's program and our community. Uh, this webinar will include some presented information from the admissions staff, as well as a really great panel discussion with Dr. Ralph Martin, our faculty member, uh, Father Richard Vagoa, uh, one of our current students in the STL, again, just about to finish up, and uh, our alumnus, Father Andrew Kieslip. Uh, and so we are really looking forward to this opportunity. Um, we ask uh, that the guests, please feel free to use the Q&A function uh, or the chat function to ask your questions. We'll be monitoring those questions and respond to them as quickly as we can, um, but we may be keeping some of those questions to help foster our panel conversation later on. Um, if you feel that we did not get to your question or you need more details, uh, we will provide you, uh, both Catherine and I, uh, with our contact information um, so you can reach out to us following the event. This event is being recorded, um, and that is for the opportunity for registrants who maybe weren't able to attend to get to view it afterwards. And so we should be sending out not only the recording, uh, but also an evaluation of the event soon thereafter. Before we continue on, I'd like to uh, begin uh, with prayer um, that our conversation and time may be fruitful and glorify God. Uh, Father Andrew, can you please uh, lead us in a prayer this evening? I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we turn to you most humbly, begging the graces of Jesus Christ, your Son. May the light of his resurrection pierce our minds and our hearts, so that we may experience the power of his risen flesh in our own. Open our hearts to the work of salvation that your Son has won for us, so that we may be ever more conformed to him, and so shine his light to all around us. We ask this in Jesus' name and through the intercession of his humble mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I think from here we can move on to just uh, some quick talking points in regards to what Sacred Heart Major Seminary offers in this licentian uh, in sacred theology in the new evangelization. Truly its purpose uh, is to prepare graduates to teach theology in pontifical universities and major seminary, uh, seminaries, but can also lead to doctorate in sacred theology work in the future. Priests may also find it greatly benefits their work in diocesan administration, ministries, or other research. Ultimately, we're trying to combine new learning with practical application, uh, trying to find solutions for our increasing secularizing culture with a strong emphasis on Catholic social analysis, uh, special attention to bioethical and family issues. This is a convenient online program um, that has summer residencies. And this program, again, is completely exclusive to priests. And you'll find probably in our conversation today how that exclusivity to priests builds community within uh, our priesthood. The structure is one online course per semester, sometimes more in the fall and winter semesters, 48 total credit hours, with four five-week summer residencies here in Detroit. There is an off-site practicum, a thesis directed by a Sacred Heart faculty advisor, and then a portion that we call the Lectio Quorum, which is an academic le lecture that a uh, soon-to-be graduate would give before a panel of faculty in their final semester once their thesis is complete. Now, if you are interested in pursuing this STL, Catherine and myself in the Office of Admissions would be happy to help you through the application process. Uh, it is short, 
online, easy to, admit, to submit, and there are some other additional uh, materials that we require and request, and we will work with you every step of the way through that application process. Um, again, if you have any questions, Catherine and I will be sharing our direct contact information uh, as well as the office information for your use. Now, at this time, I would like to uh, transition to the panel portion. It's really uh, the opportunity for you to hear directly from our faculty, from our staff, from current and past students um, to learn more about their positive experiences and learn uh, you know, why you should potentially choose to pursue this STL and the new evangelization. I'd like to start uh, with introductions uh, and then we'll move the opportunity to ask questions uh, from our guests. Um, so please panelists, can you share your name, your title, and then maybe your favorite, favorite place to be when you were here, um, obviously at the seminary um, during your time. So I'll have Catherine, can you start uh, us off please? I would love to. I am Catherine Bergeron. I am uh, the admissions and retention counselor at Sacred Heart. I love working with STL priests um, and my favorite place to be in the, um, in the seminary is the chapel. Um, it's just, it's beautiful and it's just a great place to sit and be with God. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Martin, can you go ahead next for introductions, please? Well, my, my favorite place is the chapel also. It's just such a beautiful chapel and you walk into it and you can not even prevent yourself from praying. You just, your mind and heart raises. It's just really beautiful. It's like a medieval cathedral uh, and, and, you know, it's just really great. My, my second favorite place is being in a classroom with the STL priest. It's my favorite thing to do at the seminary. It's my favorite students, and uh, it's great to be with priests who have uh, been out in the field for a while and are really not just concerned about how they can get an A, but how they can actually love God and love their neighbor and serve their people better. So I, I just love that. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Father Andrew, would you like to please go next? Uh, sure. Uh, maybe I'll start with the uh, favorite place uh, or places. Um, so uh, certainly, certainly the chapel and uh, the, the beauty of it uh, really can't be underestimated. But the second place was uh, the outdoor porch. Uh, the conversations that I had there with uh, Brother Priest were really excellent and actually personally very formative for me and, and also a blessing to rest and talk about uh, some of the things we're learning. But um, uh, my name is uh, Father Heeslip uh, or Andrew Heeslip, as has been said. I'm the Director of Religious Education for the Diocese of Lincoln, but also do a lot of work in digital media, so TV masses, uh, but also uh, video editing work, some communications work. And uh, also uh, in this past year, started teaching at our, our minor seminary, our college seminary, uh, St. Gregory uh, the Great, uh, just uh, teaching Theology 101 introductory courses to new seminarians. And um, so I'm glad to, glad to be here and chit chat about the experience uh, of the program, which uh, did quite directly influence my uh, my ministry and my priesthood, so I'm very glad to be here. Awesome, thank you very much, Father Andrew. And Father Richard, uh, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Father Richard Bigoa. I am the parish administrator here at Saint Augustine Catholic Student Center across the street from the University of Miami. And I've been here for two years now. And before that, I was the Archbishop's secretary for nine years. And I still work for him. Uh, I still go into his office once a week. And I still, um, I'm the director for the Office of Worship also here in the diocese. So um, I, I still work cl closely with him. Um, my favorite place at the seminary, of course, was the chapel. but. What's so beautiful about the seminary is it just doesn't have the big, beautiful chapel. It has also these other hidden chapels that are within the residences. And um, my favorite chapel was St. Joseph's because it was small. It was intimate, beautiful, has these amazing stained glass windows. And no one would be there. So it would be a lot of time to be able to just sit and pray. And it was 
Um, it was nice and warm for Michigan. That's kind of strange, but for a Miami guy, I, I liked it to be warm. The air conditioner wasn't on and it was just something very cozy about that experience. But, and also uh, I have to agree with Father Andrew, the porch was amazing to be able to at night, all of my, our brother priests would come out after dinner and just talk, talk about class, talk about life, talk about our priestly experience. And, and I think that that porch experience was so edifying and a beautiful time. So. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Father Richard. So why don't we get into some questions in, in regards to Sacred Heart. If we have any questions from our guests, feel free to um, chime in and, and ask a question uh, or feel free to use the chat uh, and we can certainly present those to panelists. What I think I'll start off with is just a question in uh, to, you know, maybe to our, our priests uh, and then also to Dr. Martin maybe in, in some of the other examples he's seen, but how has the STL added to your ministry uh, or your multiple ministries within your diocese and in your parishes and your priesthood? I could step in on that one. Um, one thing that happened uh, rather directly and, and very quickly, in fact, uh, in fact, my first year at uh, Sacred Heart, uh, this uh, started to unfold. Um, there began to be a, um, uh, an interest that was uh, very diverse in the Diocese of Lincoln regarding Unbound. And um, there's a lot of questions around it too. And, um, but it looked like something that could be very positive. I, I knew nothing about it. And so um, one of the first topics that uh, Dr. Mary Healy um, had on her sheet of topics to choose from her evangelization and spirituality course was Unbound and Deliverance Ministry. So I said, well, I'm the director of this uh, office, so I better better learn something about what's going on. And um, so studied that fairly, uh, fairly extensively and was very much formed by it uh, myself um, and uh, continued to pray and uh, with those five keys actually daily. And so very formative for me, but uh, through that education, I was able to um, help organize something that God was very clearly already bringing about, but that small push. So I've done a number of different programs with this particular one. It was just the slightest push uh, that blew up um, in, in such a way that, in fact, there was a period of two years where I think 40% of the hits on the Unbound website or the uh, Heart of the Father website were from people in Lincoln because it started to grow in interest. Um, we've ended up praying for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, I think we're well over a thousand now. Um, and so it's, uh, it's been a, a great blessing. And that knowledge that I gained from, from the seminary that first year actually came into um, play a few years into the Unbound Ministry when there was some fairly strong and, and somewhat antagonistic questions um, regarding the fourth key command or authority. And the education piece helped a lot, but it helped a lot because I myself was convinced. And so I could speak to that uh, from my own struggle because I had the same question years before. And um, so that's, that's one area that was a direct immediate influence. I don't want to dominate all the talking, so I'll pass it on to someone else. I, I think that I'll just go on the same vein that you're on. And we get ordained and then you get into ministry and it's just very quick and it's a lot of work. And, and I, I think that ongoing formation is so crucial to a priest and something that Father Andrew said that when you get into a program like the STL, your mind is opened up to a lot of different resources, things that maybe you didn't think about or you know didn't even know that were available to you. And, and the beauty of this evangelization course is you want to be an effective preacher. You want to save souls. You want to lead people to, to heaven. And so here you have a track or you have uh, a group of priests that have been working out in the field and uh, professors like Dr. Ralph Martin who have studied this and, and are now providing you with different resources to say, oh, I never heard of this, or this is what you're doing in your parish. Oh, wow, you tried this. And um, something like what Father was talking about with Unbound. And so this STL program really allows, even if you're not going to later teach, but I think it's a great program for any priest to come. And if you want to be an effective priest to bring people to Christ, 
you got to study, you got to continue with your ongoing formation. And something like this just opens the door, opens a, a way to look at resources and other way, uh, other uh, programs that can perhaps help your parent or your diocese. That's awesome. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Martin, I guess, can you uh, maybe touch on uh, some other experiences or maybe some other examples on how you've seen the STL uh, inspire priests uh, outside of um, the walls of Sacred Heart? Yeah. Well, I would, I would say that uh, I don't know a priest who's been through the program who doesn't say they got a lot out of it. I'm thinking of one priest right now who said the scriptures got restored to him as the word of God. Yeah because our scripture professors are really good academically. You know, Dr. Mary Healy's on the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Uh, Dr. Peter Williamson holds the Cardinal Mitre Chair, and he's co-editor with uh, Dr. Mary Healy on the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture, and they've done the whole New Testament, now they're working on the Old Testament. So we have very distinguished professors, but they're filled with faith. They believe what the church believes. They believe what Vatican II teaches about Sacred Scripture, that everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and teach first, fam, fir, firmly, faithfully, without mm -hmm. error, those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our mm -hmm. salvation. So all our professors have a view on the goal of Christ's coming, which is the salvation and uh, transformation, holiness, and they're very academically qualified, but they're, they're men and women of faith and they're living what they're teaching. So uh, I, I don't know a priest who's been through the program. It doesn't feel like they've been really enriched and really equipped to be more effective as, as a priest in their ministry. And just thinking of that one priest who said, the sacred scriptures were restored to me as the word of God. Because a lot of priests have been it's kind of fairly flaky scripture classes where it's been really more, you don't really need to believe this. Do we really need to know that Jesus said this? And, you know, of course, you know, if you don't know the original language, well, you know, why are you even preaching it? You're incompetent, you know, type of thing. But I mean, to have the priest say that the word of God was restored to them uh, is, is, you know, it's worth, it's worth everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, do we have any, any questions from, uh, from our guests uh, at the moment? If not, I can um, tee up uh, uh, another uh, question to our panelists. Does Father Fernando know that, is he sideways in your screen too? Is, is, is Father Fernando, uh, ah! Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, yes. oh, okay. <laughs> oh, now, yeah. oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, you were kind of like sideways, but now you're straight up. Thank you. Well, I guess uh, kind of going off of what you were mentioning, uh, Dr. Martin, in regards to, uh, you know, faculty who are filled with faith and obviously ac very academically sound. Um, I'd like to hear from the panelists and really we can all probably speak to this is what, what's the community like at Sacred Heart? Um, both in person uh, and then also for our, our priests and, and for Dr. Martin you're teaching in an online format during the fall and winter semesters. What, what's each of those kind of community environments like uh, for a, a priest who's going through our STL uh, program? Well, I'm, I'm only familiar with the summer sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, I, I taught online last year because of the uh, COVID. I taught mm -hmm. models of evangelization. And I was quite surprised about the level of community that people that we were able to experience together. We had priests from Africa, from Peru, from California. We had all different time zones. And I posted things online that they had to read and they had to kind of make their you know contributions. But Every each week, we also had an on a live Zoom session, just like we're having tonight, and uh, it was amazing the level of honesty, communication, personal sharing that happened in those sessions. I think all the priests in the Zoom session last summer, because of the COVID, all over the world who were part of the program, I think we got. I don't even want to say we got even closer than we would have been if we were in Detroit together. I mean, it was pretty amazing somehow people felt like really able to share 
the challenges they're facing in pastoral ministry, the challenges they're facing in their dioceses, the pain they're experiencing with particular bishops. I mean, people are really able to share really where they're at, what they're really facing in their, in their pastoral situations. And there was a lot of support, a lot of encouragement, and, and it was really very, very significant. And of course, you know, being here live, you know, it's things that happen live that can't happen online, but, you know, the online community that we had last summer in, in the models of evangelization class was really, I think, very profound, you know, so I think the priests that get into the program are hungry for something. Mm -hmm. They they know that there's more. They know that there's more in their own relationship with the Lord. They know that there's more that they need to equip them for their ministry. And, and there's a hunger there. There's an openness there. There's an honesty there, which really facilitates a very profound communion with each other. And, and just like Father Andrew was saying, Father Richard was saying about the porch, I've never been on the porch, but I'm so happy that the priest can be on the porch. I'm so happy that they can have that communion with each other because priestly brotherhood is so important, you know? And uh, so anyway, I just, I, I love the program. I love the priest, you know? I, I, I love what God is doing, you know? Yeah, and I would say one of the best parts of the program is the community and um, the caliber of priests that come to the program and the seriousness and also uh, the f how friendly priests are and wanting to share their life. And we're together for this many weeks during the summer. I never left a seminary. I was always there. And I, I just, I love being there. I love that we prayed together. We celebrated mass together. We'd be in class for a, a lot of hours together. And then we'd have meals together. So you get to really know the priest, not just in your cohort, but the, the ones that are in the program. I, I'm that I'm finishing now and I miss going to Detroit for those many weeks to, to spend. It, I saw it almost like a mini sabbatical or um, a retreat, but it was so enjoyable. One, because you're having incredible conversations about what you're studying in class. And also what's like Dr. Ralph Martin just mentioned about well, what's happening in your life, what's going on in your diocese, how's your relationship with your bishop, how, how is your relationship with your brother priest back home. And so there's, there's, there's this um, atmosphere that allows for sharing and uh, fellowship that is unique to a program that's drawing priests from all over the country to Detroit and loved it. It, it was one of the parts that, of the program that is to be um, recognized and uh, congratulated because it's really well done. Very well. Just to tag along on some of those points, I'm trying to highlight uh, the open dialogue that's available, but also the, the style of dialogue. So the unique thing is everybody has real experience, um, some very, very difficult experience that they bring to the table, but also everyone who's in that program has a pretty decent level of theological formation already, and they're seeking to increase that. So you can engage on a very personal and practical level, and also at a very strong doctrinal or theoretical level. And it's, it's really infused together. Um, what I found is that uh, the open dialogue, um, even if it was sometimes you know, somewhat pointed open dialogue, uh, was very good and it was welcomed. And I found or personally experienced a uh, real growth uh, in that process. I think, for example, of sorry to mention the porch so often, um, I had a very long uh, hour long, several hour long conversations with uh, a friend of mine and say a prayer for him. He's not doing well, uh, Father Matthias uh, Thalen. And we talked about the charismatic renewal and the gifts and various dimensions of the gifts and some subtleties and all of that very, very quite intensely. And it was because he was open to my questions and even some of my antagonistic questions, <laughs> um, but was able to speak to it and uh, that we could come to a, a real shared understanding and, and, and formed him. It was very formative in that. Um, but also with class, I remember one of uh, Dr. Martin's classes where we were discussing some, uh, some challenging things with, uh, with our own um, uh, practicing the faith and witnessing to the uh, the faith of the church and complicated situations. And um, there was an openness to deal with some more sensitive topics that uh, are innately complicated and don't have a clear answer, period. Um, but 
are you know somewhat uh, sensitive uh, regarding ecclesial life and in in our contemporary world today um and in the hierarchy too and um that was that was welcomed i appreciated both uh, the discretion and respect but also the openness to be able to speak about it i think it could have been a runaway train but it wasn't um and uh but we were able to deal with it discreetly but directly and so i, I appreciated those things in the program uh, quite a lot and found that to be a very um uh, brotherly and intellectual uh to, to, for lack of a better word uh, uh community and yeah, especially there in the summers um, the there was plenty of stuff online too that was very academically rigorous and good um so yeah i might say for sake of father price that we have diocesan mm -hmm. priests but we also have quite a few religious priests and we and for father fernando we have quite a few spanish-speaking priests <laughs> And uh, it's it's like it's really quite a quite a microcosm of the church. You know, we have somebody from Mother Teresa's order of priests who's serving in Kenya right now. We have a new religious order from Argentina, and they're serving in Washington D.C. at American University as the chaplains there, and also at Oregon State University in Corvallis. We have somebody from uh, Friars of the Renewal from Bronx, New York. Uh, I, I just did the canonical retreat for the European province of the Friars of the Renewal. We, uh, you know, so we have somebody from the EWTN religious order. I forget what they're called, Franciscan Friars or something or other. And uh, so we have a lot of religious order priests. We have a lot of diocesan priests. It's primarily American, but we have uh, lots of Hispanic priests serving in America. We, ha we have two priests from Peru in the program. You know, it's just sort of like, it's just, it's great. You know, it's just really, really wonderful. And and the diocesan and the religious priests love each other and get along together and don't look down on each other in any way. Awesome, thank you. And we, uh, have, old, we have old priests and young priests too. We have, you know, we have a Franciscan who's chaplain at Manhattan College in, in New York, who's on the older side, we have an older priest from uh, Winnipeg, Canada, uh, and we have fairly new uh, guys from uh, Minnesota, you know, from Winona. And, you know, so it's just, it's it's like everybody's one in Christ, you know, and it's just really, really good. So the STL itself, you know, identifies that it is in uh, and for the new evangelization. Uh, Father Jim asked a really great question. You know what asking kind of what are some of the courses like uh, so maybe our, our priests can give examples of maybe their favorite course uh, or some of the courses that they really found that helped their ministries um, and what specifically about evangelization is focused on in the program or how is it the, the focus uh, of the STL at Sacred Heart I jump in with that one if I could yeah, um, go right ahead one of the one of the pieces that was uh, invigorated very profoundly for me personally, and also came through in, in many of the courses, um, was the the restoration of the power of the charismatic proclamation. Uh, that was a theme underscored um, each year, and, and usually in one way or another in each different class. So some certainly more than others, um, uh, based upon the the nature of the the studies. Um, that was something that not only reached me quite uh, quite really, but also now um, carries through in my preaching and carries through in my writing with some frequency um, in such a way that there's a greater awareness of, of, uh, of those things because there's God seems to be doing that in other areas. So that was one place where um, there was a, something in the field of studies across studies that um, really had a, an impact on, on my own ministry but also has been bearing fruit as far as I can see uh, in, in the lives of others because of because of what I received. Yeah, and I would just uh, say, I would add to that, new evangelization challenges us to preach the gospel in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that really came alive during COVID. And we were shut down here in Florida from May 19th, um, March 19th to the end of May. And that's when everything that I learned at Sacred Heart just came 
back and it was pull out the books and pull out everything because you really had to become, really had to learn how to be church in a new way. And everything that I was studying, everything that we had learned was, it was so applicable to this new reality. And, um, and, and I thank God for it because really going through the course at Sacred Heart allowed me to think in a different way. I was in the model of um, what you learn in the seminary, which is not wrong, but I, I think that being at the seminary and taking these courses and the resources and the classes that are available really allows you to see ministry in a different way. And it, it's exactly that, that how do you preach and teach and um, the new evangelization and, and, and today, if we're going to get young people in the pews and we're going to be attractive to people, we, we have to definitely kind of switch gears and uh, engage in ministry in a new way, make it attractive, make it beautiful, make it something that, that is worth their time. And they want to know the Lord in a different way, engage them and hook them in so that they can then turn around and bring someone else in. But I, for in my, my life, it was uh, really COVID showed me, wow, you did learn something and you learned a lot and you were able to put it to good use for, for God's kingdom. Brother Richard was actually very creative during COVID. It's so creative that my wife became a temporary member of his parish. That's right. <laughs> she even sent in her envelope. <laughs> <laughs> he loves his daily masses and Father Richard was very creative about hearing confessions in the parking lot and drive drive through kind of cars you know everything like that you know and he had to make some adjustments when kind of law kind of came in a little bit but uh very very, very creative I, I could just say that we have kind of some core courses that uh everybody needs to take one is called Theology of the New Evangelization that talks about like the truth issues that are really are so important for the church today. There's so much doctrinal confusion. So we try to identify it and we try to clarify what's really revealed to us in sacred scripture and the tradition, catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, and then we have another course called Models of Evangelization, which is sort of like the history of evangelization in a certain way. We talk about uh, great figures in evangelization from our history but we also bring in contemporary models of evangelization. A lot of times we're able to bring in people who are really on the front lines of doing creative evangelization. We'll have them either come into class personally or we'll have them visit through Zoom, like Father James Mallon from Divine Renovation, people from Alpha, people from, you know, who are really on the cutting edge, Dave Nodar from Christ Life. And, you know, just we'll, we'll bring in the top guys who are actually doing things out in the field. Another course is called Evangelization and Spirituality. Dr. Mary Healy usually teaches that. She's got to get back to teaching that. There was somebody else taught it last year, but uh, she does a fabulous job of bringing out the contemplative and the charismatic dimensions of the Holy Spirit's work in the church. Uh, and then we have a course on cultural, cultural milieu in the new evangelization. What's the culture that we're now evangelizing in? Dr. Peter Williamson has a course that's now required. Part of our court course is called Letters of St. Paul. People rave about it. They say, you know, wow. You know, I never, I never could really put together the letters of St. Paul like like Dr. Williamson is doing type of thing. Then we have a whole bunch of uh, optional courses and, and you know seminars. And uh, every couple of years, I teach a seminar in stages of spiritual growth, which I really love doing. I do it for free. It's like an overload, but I, I just want to do it because uh, I want priests to grow in as deep as possible union with the Lord. You know, we bring on the Catholic tradition of spirituality and that. So it's just lots of, uh, lots of lots of courses, but all the courses look at it from an optic towards evangelization, like in a moral theology class, for example. It's not just abstract moral theology. It's how do you communicate this today? How do you communicate the the teachings of the Catholic Church on moral moral issues in a very hostile environment? How do you present it in a way that brings out the beauty of it, the goodness of it? Oh, this is God's compassion for the human race. It's not trying to keep the human race from having fun. But it's trying to bring the human race to a uh, peace, a joy, a love that can only happen by union with Christ and obedience to his teaching. 
If I can uh, speak to that uh, point about uh, the emphasis on evangelization a little bit, uh, it's uh, just from my own experiences of uh, two particular classes, but it could be applied to others. Um, uh, one of them was uh, Dr. Martin's Models of Evangelization class, and the other one was um, one I've referenced already, uh, Mary Healy's um, uh, Evangelization Spirituality. Um, uh, in both of those classes, uh, there was uh, something that was very convicting of me uh, personally, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, one was uh, what I heard is is the faith that I share. I heard the Orthodox Catholic faith, and but I heard it in a fresh and living way, with the point and a, and a sort of a, a pierce toward evangelization. I remember that in uh, Mary Healy's class, where her her doctrine was exceedingly clear and expressed very well but it had a very, very strong and clear charismatic dimension to it, which was exciting to me personally. Likewise with uh, Dr. Martin, when he started looking at the models of evangelization, he drew from saints that are, are known and loved and uh, truly uh, canonized in the, in the fullest sense of the word. That means their whole life and work is canonized as, as a model. Sometimes when we just look at something historically, there can be a value in that, but it's hard to draw out how St. Patrick is a model of evangelization now. And yet he did that very well. Uh, likewise with St. Francis de Sales and showing the very concrete practical dimension of here's what he did. He's a saint and a model and an example. And here's how we can learn something from that and applying it to evangelization here and now. And uh, I appreciated that personally, the, the Orthodox Catholic dimension oriented toward evangelization. It was very, it was comforting in the first part, but also invigorating. Uh, in the second part. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for, for those insights. They're very, very helpful. Um, we haven't had any uh, new questions come in just yet, but I feel <laughs> like it would be great to, to kind of get uh, everyone's perspective on um, not only inside the classroom, but outside of the classroom. Uh, and I know that you have kind of touched on this in, in different ways, but how has uh, the outside of the classroom interactions with your uh, classmates and colleagues given you um, kind of renewal uh, and, and given you additional information? Well, we are getting closer to, to the end of uh, kind of our structured time here. Um, I'd just like to ask our panelists, uh, Father Andrew, uh, Father Richard, is there anything that you would like to share kind of again from your priest perspective of pursuing this uh, program that, that you think uh, a prospective or interested priest might need to know? It's a real <laughs> academic program. You have to study uh, quite diligently. Um, I suppose that'd be important to know. A lot of reading. But what I would say is it is doable. I was uh, a secretary to the Archbishop when I was in the program. I had a lot of different jobs, but like all priests, you got all very busy, but it is a doable and a very enjoyable program. Um, it's very structured. You know exactly what you got to do. There's a, a whole timeline of, of when it's what's expected and when you need to turn these things in and what the classes are all about. And so uh, you have a great staff that if, if you don't understand where the path is going or what do you need and, and uh, they're there to help you very friendly. They, they love priests and they, 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 it's, they want you to be in the program. And so you feel very welcome from day one. And um, so I would just encourage any priest who is on the fence or is thinking about it or knows someone who to do this, because as I mentioned earlier, ongoing formation is so important. People in the pew are hungry for the word of God and they want a good message. They want a priest who knows uh, what they're saying and what they've studied. And so um, I would say do it. Awesome. Thank you. So oh, go ahead, Father Andrew. I would say also that anybody that's submitted to the program we want them to be successful. Yeah. We think they can be successful. Yeah. We'll do everything we can to help them be successful. And it's very, very rare that anybody isn't. Right. If they're willing to do the work. Yeah. I found that uh, adaptability from some professors. Uh, so my, um, my mother passed away during my time in the program. Father got very sick. And uh, a couple of other smaller things happened. Um, but the professors are very adaptive uh, to uh, the need for an extension or, or whatnot. And I appreciated that. So they're not just like, well, we'll allow it, but they're very kind and cordial and, and loving about it. 
uh, under compassion and not a two. So that's what I experienced. And that was a uh, uh, plus. I also found the online courses um, during the year. This is very manageable in the midst of other work. Uh, definitely need the, if you can pull the plug in the summer so you can be fully present. But I knew some guys who did very well and they would fly back and forth uh, every, they'd be there for the week, leave for the weekend, come back for the week. I was very impressed by that. I don't think I could have done that myself, but uh, it's, it is possible. That's racking up the air miles for sure. Um, that's, that's. I would fun. say also that even though Father Richard never left the seminary, <clears throat> a lot of priests did. Yeah, that is true. They, they went to Tigers ball games mm -hmm. and they, they took tours of Detroit. And, and uh, you know, they did various things while, while they were here, which was part of refreshment, recreation, relaxation. But I'd also say that it's a little opportunity, a little bit like for a retreat. You know, there, there's a spirituality component to a lot of this. You know, when, when you consider the revealed word of God, it draws you into deeper relationship with him and it challenges you to a deeper surrender and uh, so it's a little bit like a spiritual renewal. It's a fraternal renewal with your fellow brother priest. A lot of times these relationships continue after the program and priests continue to be in touch with each other and friends with each other. They, they know they can trust each other. They know they can talk to each other about some of these things in an ongoing way. So it's sort of, it, it establishes a fraternity that can be a continuing support even after the program. And it's an opportunity for a little getting away from it all it's really hard for priests to get away from it all. It's really hard for priests to get away from it all. Being away for five weeks each summer, it's kind of needed, you know? You, you kind of need to distangle from, from stuff as much as you can, and it's, it's, it's a renewal. Patrick, yeah. can I say a thing, please? Yeah. And I, I sort of shared this with Dr. Martin when I called him um, shortly after he had done a retreat here for our priest. Oh, our I remember you now, Father. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I guess my my biggest concern, and I, I know I hope this is not offending anybody here. You're very uh, educated, uh, well educated people. I just don't want, or I'm just concerned about it being so heady that we lose the sense of the Holy Spirit is molding, guiding, and teaching us, and opening our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the work of the Father. And if it's so academically heady, that's great as long as you stay in an academically heady environment dealing with academically heady people. But the people sitting in the pews, the people you encounter in counseling, the children you encounter in the schools, and everything, that's not them. And, and that, if somebody could sort of address that issue, because that's, that's a big concern for me. And, 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 I, and I, I don't. I love academics. Uh, if you talk to any professor that knew me when I was in seminary, they would tell you I was like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I was just eating the stuff up like crazy because I was so excited about learning and putting, connecting the dots. But at the same time, just like, just like when we as priests celebrate Holy Week, if you're by yourself and you're a pastor and you got to do all the, do this, do that, put this here, make sure this here, and then you can get so caught up in the doing that you miss the Holy Spirit's movement in the celebration. So if somebody could address those issues, I'd appreciate it. I think, yeah, I think that's a, a very great question, uh, Reverend King. And uh, I'm sure our priest can speak to that. Maybe even provide the example of kind of what the offsite practicum looks like and, and the other ways that, again, you've allowed the Holy Spirit to, to form that academic side that you got. Yeah, go ahead, Father Andrew. Speak to that. Um, so I just want to directly about the Holy Spirit and, and an inspiration that came quite directly from the program and connected to my work here is uh, regarding confirmation and how to begin to open the door to realize that it is the Spirit of God that comes upon you in confirmation and why it's so necessary to be open to his promptings and his workings and the experience that he provides because it's through that that he empowers someone to evangelize. That uh, this, the kind of spirit of the program of evangelization, according to docility to the spirit, um, came through and uh, over basically after I graduated was still very fresh in my mind. 
So worked with um, all the fifth grade teachers, that's when we confirm in the Diocese of Lincoln, uh, worked with each of them to uh, really reset our, our, our focus for our formation for our confirmandi to have this evangelical thrust and emphasis and this pneumatological or the Holy Spirit driven emphasis, uh, but in such a way that the kids can pick it up. Um, so what? It, how can I tell someone about the love of Christ, even if I'm a fifth grader, because if the Holy Spirit's real and he's really changing me, he's going to give me some strength. And how can you get a fifth grader ready for that? Um, same with like praying, um, learning how even for young kids to pray with with each other or how a young kid can share just a little piece of, of Jesus in their life. Um, this, this has worked and it's gone very well. Um, I would say that uh, my, my experience of the program, but also the inspiration it provided was, uh, I, I believe very strongly, I'm uh, led by the spirit in my life, but also uh, led by the spirit in, in the actual concrete administrative pastoral, especially educational work um, in the Diocese of Lincoln. Um, that's a, a personal example that I found, which was a direct uh, overlay and dovetail with uh, many of the things uh, in the in the program that I wouldn't have been necessarily open to or was seen uh, without uh, the, the professors, and I mean this very seriously, uh, being open to the Holy Spirit. I would have, if it was just an, inflict, uh, an inflicting of uh, uh, ideas, uh, who knows, I might have said, ah, bye bye. <laughs> Well, I, I would say um, that all the courses are pastoral. They're into they're academic, but every single course helps you in the parish. And I, I know that, when, like in, in Dr. Ralph Martin's class, the models of evangelization, I, I remember I would every day you'd sit in class and say, I got to do this in my parish. Oh wow! I got to read up on this, and there'd be different programs I had never heard of, and I, and how can I bring that to my parish? And so now that I'm in the parish, I still have all my work that I did at the seminary, and I'll go back through my notes and say, "Wow!" That, and there's all of this information that your other brother priests are also giving you. That, but but I what I would just say I would reiterate that every course is a course that's going to help you in your parish to be a better preacher, to understand scriptures better, to really uh, delve into what the Holy Spirit is asking of you. Um, but yeah, it's intellectual because you have to study. There, there's academic work to it, but I would say it's very pastoral. Every class is very pastoral because it's applicable to what you're doing in the parish. I would say that um, quite a few of the professors in the program are really trying personally themselves to live lives guided by the Holy Spirit and are trying to be maximally open to the Holy Spirit and actually are pretty mature in, in a life formed by the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, you really can't study the letters of St. Paul and not have a profound understanding of the Holy Spirit. And Dr. Williamson, who teaches that course, is very committed personally to living that way. And he communicates that uh, you know, in his course, he's fed by the epistles of St. Paul, and he feeds you from not only his academic knowledge of the epistles of St. Paul, but his appropriation in his own personal life. And so, uh, and that's true with a lot of the professors, Dr. Mary Healy, her whole life, she's a consecrated virgin. Her whole life is focused on being docile to the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit overshadow her sharing her profound biblical knowledge so much so that she got appointed to the Pontifical Biblical Commission. But as St. Therese of Lisieux says, the more you grow in the spiritual life, the simpler it becomes. And unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And so that's the spirit of, of a whole number of the professors, you know, at the seminary. Uh, they're, they're concerned about the real living God. They're concerned about these courses kind of contributing to our relationship with the living God and our service of the living God. That's fantastic. And thank you so much uh, again to our guests uh, and to our panelists for being here and to uh, continuing this conversation and hopeful interest in uh, the Lysentian and Sacred Theology. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. Oh, it looks like Father Fernando, did you have a, a question? Oh, you are on mute still, uh, Father. 
Okay. I'm there we sorry go. for that. This, the first question I have is this one. Uh, the five weeks that you have in the summer, is the classes are Monday to Friday? Uh, because I am three hours away from Detroit. So I'm just thinking about the possibility to going back to the parish uh, for the Sunday masses. Uh, or if you have classes on Saturdays, no classes. The second question I have is, is okay. The Monday to Friday. Nice. Okay. And the second. Okay. And the second question I have is this one. When you have the uh, the classes during the semesters via uh, internet, do you have them via Zoom that you are actually having the class in that moment with the professor? Or, or you have just yes, the material that you receive, read it, investigate, and then just respond like a kind of a quiz or test or a paper, because they have uh, have those two classes in, in those formats. One, I just received the material, and every weekend I submitted the work, and and now I noted them. We have the Zoom classes, but we the whole class is at the same time taking the class via Zoom. Most of the online classes do not depend on people having to be there at the same time, but there you can do them anytime at your okay. convenience and submit your okay. contributions at your convenience. Sometimes a professor will say, can we find a time where we all could be together at the same time occasionally, just so we can see each other and get to know each other and relate to each other. But that's not a required part of, of any class that's voluntary if a class can agree on a time where they could be together. But it's usually designed so that you can do the work whenever you can do it and submit it whenever you can submit it. Okay, thank you. Those are fantastic questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin, for responding to that. I, we appreciate it. Um, so I think this is our time. I have included in the chat the contact information for the Office of Admissions. I will also include my direct information and I'll ask that Catherine does so as well. Um, Catherine and myself are happy to work with any priests who are interested in the application process and, and learning more about our STL. Um, and so we will kind of keep that information in the chat uh, for the remainder uh, and, uh, of just the short time. Um, our panelists, I would like to thank greatly uh, for volunteering your time. I know how busy not only your time is, and, you know, your life is, and, and our guests, uh, how busy your time is. So for you to take out an hour to meet with us, to learn more is fantastic. Uh, and to our panelists is always greatly appreciated. Um, as I put my contact information in, are there any final words from uh, Father Andrew or Father Richard or Dr. Martin that you'd like to share with our guests? I'd like to say that it's really wonderful to see Father Andrew and Father Richard again. See you too. They're, they're fantastic priests and it's great to know what they're doing, serving God's people. Amen, likewise. I really enjoyed this. It, it felt like I was back in class again a little bit. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually building some nostalgia right now saying, oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this was a blessing for me. Thank so for the invitation. Yes, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, God bless to everybody. Uh, and thank you again for being here to our guests. And thank you for our panelists for um, your insights. Where they are greatly appreciated. Um, I'll end in a, in a glory be, if that is okay. Um, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Father, Amen. Son, Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah, take care. Yeah, good seeing you guys again. Yeah. Good night.